I just want to start by saying that David Lowry is a hero for all of us who have been fighting for artist rights and, and he's got a lot of courage and uh, it moves me to be here and I, I would come anywhere he asked me to come to speak. So uh, I wrote this book, uh, came out about seven months ago to give you a sense of how much things have changed. When it was about to come out in England, the publisher said, you should probably take the second half of that subtitle off about undermining democracy, because how did Facebook or Google have anything to do with undermining democracy? <laughs> so, needless to say, when the pub paperback comes out next month, that's back in the English edition. So, as, as David said, I've had a kind of crazy career. I worked for the band, I worked for Bob Dylan, I worked for Janis Joplin, I produced movies with Marty Scorsese and Ben Benders, and I even, through this last one, in, I, I famously was strangled by Harvey Weinstein oh my God. at the Sundance Film Festival in 1996, in public. Uh, over a movie. So I knew I knew what a bully he was a long time ago. Uh, so I want to talk to you a little bit about, you know, I come to this because I believe in artists and I, I happen to see a musician friend of mine, Levon Helm, who was the drummer in the band. Uh, you know, he made a pretty good living. And even though the band stopped recording in the late 70s, the record royalties continued on into the 80s and 90s because in the 80s, everybody got a CD of every all that vinyl stuff that you used to have. You bought your collection all over again and the band's music kind of held up. And so up until 2000, Levon was making almost $100,000 a year in royalties. And then Napster arrived and that just stopped. And it just so happened that he got throat cancer that same year. And so he couldn't go out and he had a kind of small solo career, but he couldn't even go out and sing. And so some friends in Woodstock kind of gathered around him and lifted him up and had this thing called the Midnight Rambles and he would play drums and other people would sing. And eventually they could make enough money that he could pay for his health insurance, but just enough. And when he died, he was flat broke, and we put on a benefit to help his wife hold on to their house in Woodstock. And that just seemed really unfair to me, because I could go in 2009, 2010 on YouTube and see band songs with four million streams, mm -hmm. but none of that money was flowing to Libra. So I began to try and think what had happened. So, as David said, I'm 70 years old, so I, I was actually around when the internet was beginning to be developed in 68. And it was actually a kind of countercultural project. The whole idea was we need to decentralize control of communications. Because those of us with gray hair in this room remember in 1968 there were three television networks and one newspaper in any town, and that was the media. And so the idea of having this decentralized media distribution network seemed like a really good idea. And obviously, the people who put up the money for it, ARPANET, that was the Army, the Defense Department, they had their own reason for wanting a decentralized network, which was if the Soviet Union dropped a bomb in Atlanta, the network would ride around it and stay up. But, as I said, it was a counterculture project. This is a picture of Ken Kesey and Stuart Brand. And these guys would run these massive 5,000 people acid trips at night, and then they'd go build a network in the daytime called the Whole Earth Electronic Link, which is based off the Whole Earth Catalog idea, and it was one of the early networks. And so that idea, survived for about 20 years. 
And then some people came out of some West Coast universities and other universities, uh, namely Jeff Bezos, Larry Page, Peter Thiel, who were schooled on the libertarian philosophy of Ayn Rand. And if any of you have had the displeasure of reading Ayn Rand's work know that it always stars a entrepreneur hero who's brought down by the mob, by democracy. Uh, and so Peter Thiel, who was the most <coughs> fervent one of her acolytes, said, I no longer believe that capitalism and democracy are compatible. And he went so far as to suggest that you should set up your company on a platform called Seasteading off in the middle of the ocean away from any government control. The trouble was he never could get anybody to want to move to the middle of the ocean and, and live on one of those stupid platforms. So that didn't work out so well. But he did form a company called PayPal. And out of PayPal came what he proudly calls the PayPal Mafia. And they mostly, and you notice they're all men, uh, they run most of the big Silicon Valley companies today. Now, Thiel had four basic ideas of how he could create fortunes in a winner-takes-all business, because his understanding was that the basic idea of networks was that you could have a winner-takes-all business. There's a thing called Net Metcalfe's Law, which says that the, the worth of a network is equal to the square of the number of users. So it's exponential. So there would get to be a place where you would only want, need one search engine. You would only need one e-commerce everything store. And eventually, you would only need one social network company. And so the way to get there would be to have a, a business sector where there was no government regulation whatsoever. Where there was no taxes. So Amazon could sell books with no sales taxes and put 4,000 independent bookstores out of business because they had to pay 8% sales tax. From a business with no copyright. So what YouTube says to the music business is your content is going to be on YouTube whether you want it to or not. What you have to decide is you want to sign a quote-unquote license and we'll give you a tiny little bit of advertising money or else we'll keep the advertising money. Uh, that's not a willing buyer, willing seller deal. That's an extortion racket. And it's very successful. And then there should be no competition because monopoly would be the perfect form of business. And so Thiel made the very bold statement in the early 1990s, and this is really before Google really takes off or anything, was that Silicon Valley would come to dominate the world economy in the future. He turned out to be right. So 10 years ago, the largest companies in the world were oil companies and banks and manufacturing companies like General Electric, and today the largest companies in the world are all tech companies. And that was pretty quick. So then the question is, well, what? how did that happen and what happened to the people that made all the content that made these companies so popular? Because people didn't go to Google just to look for cat videos. Good to see entertainment, art, and all sorts of stuff. So here's what happened to the music business since Napster showed up. 71% fall in revenues. Here's what happened to the newspaper business, even worse since Google showed up. An 82% fall in revenues. There are 50% fewer people working as working journalists today in America than there were 10 years ago. And of course, this is what happened to the retail business since Amazon came on the scene. So 
you know, that's the number of stores that went out of business last year. And this is the number of malls that are in danger of going closing uh, this year. And Amazon's dominance in the e-commerce business has just risen. Over Christmas, Amazon took 89% of all e-commerce sales in the United States. 89% to one company. So it's not like people <coughs> stop listening to music or reading books or going to movies or reading newspapers. It's just that the money got reallocated to the tune I think of almost $50 billion a year from people who made content to people, the companies that owned these dominant platforms. And as, as you can see, the the revenue streams of Google, Amazon, and Facebook go just the opposite direction of the revenue streams of the content business. And as Peter Thiel says, competition is for losers. If you want to build a lasting company, you have to build a monopoly. And they did. So that's Facebook compared to every other social network. That's Google's 89% market share compared to Bing, which is a little red line down at 3%. That's uh, Amazon's share of the book business. And last year, Facebook companies or Google companies took 87% of all new app internet advertising money. So what happens to the individual songwriter. So this is just an example. So you may think that Spotify is the biggest streaming music platform, but that's not true. It's YouTube. YouTube has almost 60% of the streaming music. And that's just audio files with a with a, a record cover on the front. And yet they pay less than 11% of the money into the streaming music business. And the reason this is, is because they have <coughs> a provision called Safe Harbor that makes it impossible for an individual musician or record company to demand that they keep their content off of YouTube. You can file a takedown notice and the music companies file, I don't know, hundreds of millions of takedown notices a year, maybe it's in the billions. And the song will go down, but it'll go right back up the next day. It's like playing whack-a-mole. It's a total joke. So if, for instance, you happen to have a very popular song and you could get a million downloads on iTunes, the record company or you could make $900,000. If you got a million streams on YouTube, you would make $900. That won't pay your rent. In <laughs> Athens, Georgia, I don't think. So there's well, another problem with YouTube. That's, this is a, a Procter & Gamble ad on the front of an ISIS video. Now, needless to say, Procter & Gamble was a little disturbed to find that their ads were showing up on front of ISIS propaganda videos. When I started researching my book, there were 77,000 ISIS videos on YouTube. So last year, the advertisers began to complain about this. They could never get a straight story. Was, was the money they were paying to YouTube going to ISIS, or was it just going to YouTube? They knew they were paying for it, but they didn't know where the money was going. The same thing happened two months ago in the UK when it was discovered that there were 30,000 pedophile videos on YouTube and YouTube's response when this was raised by the London Times was, okay, we'll demonetize those videos, meaning we'll take the advertising off so the pedophile video makers don't get the money from it. But I mean, hello. So. Um, so the subtitle of my book makes reference to the fact that these companies are undermining democracy. And I just want to give you one quick example of that. So this is a headline from the Washington Post 
from May 16th of 2016. So to remind you, this is in the middle of the presidential election. Up until that point, Facebook had human curators on the trending topics. But for two months, Fox News and Breitbart had been pounding on them to say, those human curators are prejudiced against conservative media. You have to get them out of the picture. And eventually Zuckerberg gave in and he took the human curators out. And you can see this little point, the little red dot down there, that's when he took the human curators out. Because needless to say, after that day, you could put up a post saying, the Pope endorses Donald Trump, and the computer didn't know that wasn't true. And as long as you could hit that post with 50,000 or 100,000 bots, it would go right to the top of the trending topics. It would go right to the top of Google's search algorithm. And so it became true. And as Tim Berners-Lee, who is a, a friend and the man who invented the World Wide Web says, those kids in Macedonia who were making 5,000 a week manufacturing fake news with, and having a website with a Google AdSense account and a Facebook page and the ping back and forth between the two, they learned very quickly that truth was much more clickable than untruth. Untruth was much more unclickable than, than truth. And, and so, um, this was something that obviously one side of the political spectrum understood. As you know, Facebook embedded, had two <coughs> embedded employees in the Trump campaign and Hillary had none. So, so Trump and Bannon knew how to use this stuff and the other side didn't, but that doesn't make it any good. So I want to talk about one other question. These people call themselves libertarians. But the question we have to ask ourselves is, are you free if you look at your smartphone 250 times a day? This is a very popular book in Silicon Valley called Hooked. And it's all about how to build addictive applications good friend Tristan Harris, who was at Google as an engineer and quit because he realized that everything that they were doing was key towards addicting young people of your age to be constantly checking your phone. And it's a very simple scheme that looks quite like the Skinner box that you may have studied in Psych 101. If the mouse got a reward every time you click the bar, it would only click the bar when it was hungry. But the mouse doesn't get a reward every time it clicks the bar. Sometimes it gets a reward, sometimes it doesn't. That's like getting likes. So you don't always get a like every time you post something, but you check back to see the likes, and that's this random reward thing is the whole way that it keeps you working for Mark Zuckerberg for between an hour and two hours a day for free manufacturing advertising profiles for him to sell to two billion customers. Karl Marx would never understand how that got around to happen. So what businesses are these companies really in? They're in the surveillance capitalism business. Data is the new oil. They're only in one thing. They want more data, and they want you to give it to them. And if you don't give them enough on your smartphone, then they'll put a smart speaker in your house. But it's not a smart speaker, it's a smart microphone. And it's always on, as the district attorney in Mississippi found out three months ago, we had a domestic violence case the arresting officer comes, the husband says, I didn't do anything, the wife says he tried to strangle me, and the officer noticed there was an Amazon Alexa 
in the kitchen where this incident happened to happen. So he just suggested, well, maybe we should find out what's on the Alexa. And Amazon put up a little fight and then they gave in and they gave him the records. And of course, the whole incident, the screams, the yelling was all on the Alexa log. So don't think it's only on when you ask it a question. It's there to record every keyword in your life uh, that you might want so they could sell you more stuff. And understand that both Amazon, Google, and now Facebook will want to embed those speakers everywhere into your life, into your car, everywhere. Now, you may say, well, younger generation doesn't care a bit about privacy, and that's an old trope. That's what Zuckerberg says. It's an outdated concept, privacy. So I spent some time with the people at Consumer Reports, and they said, look, you think that you're driving auto insurance rates are set because of how well you drive. It's got nothing to do with that. It's set by where you drive. So I, for many years, have worked at USC, and USC is downtown LA, considered a dicey neighborhood by most auto insurance companies. So my auto insurance rates are about 15% higher than my wife's, who doesn't go down to USC every day. Now, you know how they find that out. Uh, so, you heard a little bit earlier about social credit, and I want to kind of let you understand that this is the dystopian end point for the surveillance capitalism business. So, Sesame Social Credit is an application built by Alibaba. Uh, and essentially what it does is it takes your credit score, how well you repay your credit cards, and overlays on it an artificial intelligence mediate score of everything you do on the web and off the web from connected platforms. So if David happened to play video games for six hours on some Saturday, his social credit score would go down because he'd be considered a slacker. <laughs> if his wife crossed the street in Shanghai, in the middle of the street, jaywalking, and was caught by one of the ubiquitous facial recognition cameras, her social credit score would go down because she's considered <coughs> a slacker. If Sandra happened to post something on WeChat critical of the Chinese government, her social credit score would go down because she considered unpatriotic. Now you think, why would anybody be on this? There are 220 million Chinese on this service. Xi Jinping at the party meetings two months ago suggested that everybody in China should be on the service. And the millennials use their social credit score on their dating apps to prove that they're good, patriotic, and forming citizens, which may tell us something about what you said about conforming citizens. Now, one of my guesses about this is, obviously, as anyone who's been in China knows, the ratio of millennial men to women is three or four to one. So maybe it's important for a man to prove that he's very patriotic and, and won't get into any trouble with the government to get himself a wife. But um, that's the dystopian end. And, and by the way, Facebook could institute this in about 10 minutes if it wanted to. So here's my problem with what happens with the power of monopolies. There's a whole chapter in my book on how Google captured the Obama administration regulatory. The assistant attorney general for antitrust came from Wilson Sonsini, which was Google's lawyer. The CTO of the government came from Google. The head of the patent office was Google's patent officer, a lawyer. The head of the 
White House telecommunications office came from Google. It was like 28 people from Google just were seconded to the Obama administration. Eric Schmidt visited the White House 280 times in two years, you know, 10 times more than any other CEO. And when Google got in trouble with the Federal Trade Commission and the, the staff was going to find them for the same, you know, results that the Europeans find them for 2.7 billion. The political guys got them out of trouble. So when the Trump administration came in, the leading candidate for FTC chairman was a guy named Sean Reyes, who had been the Attorney General of Utah. Good guy. Had only one problem. He had taken on Google once. And they basically just blackballed him. They vetoed him. And so they got Joe Simons, who's much more acceptable to Google, and he became the Federal Trade Commission. So I'm going to just end by one thought. We have had a bunch of discussion earlier about antitrust, and there was some notion brooded about, well, maybe antitrust in the old-fashioned Justice Brennan sense, that is, competition is critical. Maybe it's outdated, and it's anti-innovation. So I'm going to make the argument that Silicon Valley would not exist if it hadn't been for antitrust. So in 1956, again, only the gray hairs here will remember this, there was a monopoly phone company in the United States called at and And in order to keep their monopoly, the government went to them and said, you have to sign this consent decree in which Bell Labs, your research and development facility, has to license for free to any American company or individual every single patent that Bell Labs has. Now, it just so happened that Bell Labs had the patent for the transistor, the laser, the satellite, the semiconductor, the uh, cellular system. I mean, basically all of the foundational patents of <coughs> the digital age. So out of those three patents came Hewlett Packard, Texas Instruments, Motorola, Fairchild Semiconductor, eventually Intel, ComSat, a bunch of other companies that started Silicon Valley. Never would have happened if it hadn't been for those free patents. 20 years later, IBM was the dominant mainframe computer seller. And you could not buy an IBM computer unless you bought IBM software. In other words, they bundled the hardware and the software. So the government sued IBM and said, you have to unbundle these things. I have to be able to buy your computers and install other software. IBM fought them for 13 years, but near the end of that battle, they were developing the personal computer, and they said, screw it, this is too much a hassle. We'll let these two young kids from Seattle make the software for our PC, and we'll make the hardware, and that's where all the money is, and we'll let these two kids make the software, Bill Gates and Paul Allen, and we know where that ended up. So then Microsoft becomes another giant, and 20 years later, and if you wanted to buy a PC, you had to use Internet Explorer, Microsoft's browser and search facility. You could not install any other browser, so the government sued them, and eventually the government won. And that allowed Google to enter the marketplace and become now, 20 years later, the dominant force. So it may be that we're in this 20-year cycle and it's time for new antitrust efforts. Of course, the problem is that the regulatory capture side, that is the political influence of Google, is so huge that it may be impossible. But, I would say that having started talking about this seven months ago, 
I sense a good sense of change, that people are much more interested in thinking about the power of these platforms than they were when I first published the book, and that gives me hope. So, thank you very much. I'm happy to take some questions. Anybody have a question? David. <laughs> so, so what? I know you're not. What? What would you do? What would you suggest we do to say Google or Facebook to? to because I, I'm concerned that it's not that. I'm concerned that there's like all of these innovations that are not happening that we will never know that we're missing. Right? Like as if Bell Labs hadn't got the patents sort of taken essentially right. away from them and given to everybody, we wouldn't know that we were missing the so, cellular phone system yeah. or the internet or things like, like this, so right? So there's three <laughs> ways that we could think about this. One would be to apply the same remedies to Google that we applied to AT&T. So Google has about 10,000 patents, including autonomous cars, Nest, thermostats, all these things, right? So what if Google had to give those patents away for search algorithms and advertising everything to anybody for free? That's one possibility. Obviously, Google would freak out at that, but that's a possibility. The second area of, of immediate attack right now is in the area of privacy. The European Union is about to put into place something called GDPR, which stands for General Data Privacy Regulation, which goes into effect in May of 2018. It essentially will change the default from, okay, I've signed on to Facebook, now you can have any data that you can get from me any way you can get it. And I don't even have to be on Facebook for you to get data to Facebook. If you, if you just happen to click the Facebook like button on the New York Times, you're giving Facebook all the data you've got. So uh, that change, to my mind, would mean that Facebook and Google would have to ask your permission for certain kinds of data to get. And they have to ask that regularly, not once. So that would obviously change their business. The third thing is that guys like Tim Berners-Lee are working on platforms that might allow you to put all your data in a kind of black box and only let it out if you're getting some positive benefit for that. Okay, you're an airline, you want to know something about my travel habits, but what kind of discounts are you going to give me in return for giving you access to that? Um, so that's one thought. I mean, the next thought from my mind is it's a very simple change to the safe harbor law, which would be what I call take down, stay down, and it's not my law, but it's 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 an idea that if a musician says I do not want my content on YouTube, then it becomes YouTube's responsibility to keep it off, and they can do that really easily. They have content ID, they have the total ability to block it on the upload side, just like they block porn. You notice there's no porn on YouTube. It's because they have very smart artificial intelligence algorithms that when they see a bare breast, it just sh shunts it into another queue and a human looks <coughs> at it and occasionally it's a National Geographic film and it gets let on, but mostly it gets thrown in the trash. Um, so these would not be hard for these companies to implicate and put in place. So, I mean, those three things are the the core things without trying to change everything. I mean, one of the strange things that we've noticed is that, uh, you don't know this, but Google through its front organization, the Internet Association, fought for like three months a law called SESTA, 
which was essentially a law that would make it illegal to send people to child sex trafficking sites. And this would be a modification of the safe harbor. And Google fought it tooth and nail until at some point it just became obvious that fighting against having a law against childhood sex trafficking was probably a bridge too far. And so they gave up. Um, but, you know, things are changing. We'll see. Yeah. When you were talking about the um, commercials on like ISIS pages and all that, yeah. who, who did get the money? Well, like, they YouTube, YouTube won't tell me. Okay. I, I've asked them multiple times. Yeah. They won't say if the money actually went to ISIS because ISIS had set up the page and set up the account. But my guess is it probably did. Right. Um, certainly the money in the UK case of the pedophile videos did go to the guys who put up the pedophile video sites. So, um, you know, these companies set up their whole advertising infrastructure to be frictionless. Anybody who's ever bought an ad on, on Facebook knows it's pretty simple. You just set up a page and you give them your credit card. And so there's no check-in. That's why the Russians could buy ads, you know, on, on Facebook for the election. You know, they, and so sometimes this notion that frictionless is great is not necessarily the right answer. Yeah? So you're talking about these different um, entities that are in the uh, communications <coughs> world and expecting them to be self-regulating in a way by passing these laws. Who oversees them from a government level? I mean, do we have the resources? Do we have the money to actually So this goes to a discussion we were having in the earlier panel, which is two basic ideas about antitrust and regulation. You know, one says, okay, we'll allow big, huge companies to grow and get huge, but we'll regulate them. We'll watch them like we watch railroads and utilities and airlines and stuff like that, or cable TV. And I, I, quite frankly, don't think that works out so well. The other theory is, which was Justice Brennan's theory, which is if you have enough competition, then somebody would offer you a search engine that wouldn't vacuum all your data and retain it and do all that stuff. And, and maybe there would be some competition. If Facebook had to compete against Instagram and WhatsApp, maybe one of them would offer me a service that didn't, you know, vacuum everything I have and sell it. So, <coughs> I mean, yeah, yeah I, I would only say one thing. Right now, there is no market solution to the problems I'm posing. In other words, I don't believe if I asked everybody in this room to invest in a company to take on Google in the search engine space, I think you would all run to the door, right? You, you're not going to give me your money to do that. Because if Bill Gates lost three billion trying to compete against Google, I'm, I'm not going to do that. So I don't think, so inevitably, I mean, the Europeans think there is a solution, which is, Okay, we're going to tell Google it can't benefit its own services over anybody else's services. We're going to tell Amazon it can't push its content that it makes over the third-party contents that it's supposed to be selling. And we'll see if that works. Yeah. Well, to follow up to that, speaking of the European Union's willingness to engage with these big companies, it's sort of developing a bifurcated system where it's one way in Europe and then another way. It's like the right to be forgotten exists over there and it doesn't here. How important do you think the EU's willingness to go up against these entities is in terms of what may happen on 
you know, this side of the ocean. Well, the big question then becomes, do the rest of the world follow a European model or do they follow the American model? Yeah. And, you know, having just been in Australia and New Zealand, they're looking towards the European model. Um, so, but I also think that the Americans are watching the Europeans too. And, and for the first time, someone mentioned Delrahim. Potentially, maybe Delrahim is going to get a little tougher than his predecessor was in terms of looking at mergers. Um, you know, there's nothing like a good model to kind of set a standard that maybe we should rethink this. And, you know, this whole idea of consumer welfare is kind of nonsensical because in that sense, you know, because Amazon has so much power, as Chris pointed out, they could, it's, if, if the only thing you have to ask is if Amazon buys another company, your price is going to go up or down. Amazon could constantly price, push prices lower and become the only retailer in America. Would that be a good outcome? Don't think so. Especially since everybody was a producer, and it's not just musicians and book authors, it's just people making furniture that have to sell on Amazon. Everybody is getting screwed by their power. Yeah. Um, are you think uh, there's a professor named Richard Epstein who has done a lot of research into Google's ability to manipulate elections by search placement, yeah. and, and this t kind of ties into the Facebook emotional contagion research. This sort of thing. Do you have a point of view about um, how serious, how seriously we should be concerned about the ability of these people to actually manipulate elections without any? I mean, set aside the Russian thing, I mean, they got caught with that. Yeah. I don't mean third parties, I mean down to themselves, the companies themselves, the platforms themselves. Yeah, I'm, I'm incredibly concerned. You know, I mean, I, I think that, that, okay, so Chris's question was, how concerned am I about the ability of Google or Facebook to manipulate elections? Since we know that Facebook can manipulate your emotions, they've already proven that. And Richard Epstein has shown that Google can change search results in such a way to change your feelings. So the question is, obviously, we've never had a media system where everybody is on these platforms. You know, I mean, even CBS News at its height had 25% market share. So we've never had a place where you've got that kind of power. Um, but here's the problem. You notice that last week Facebook said, okay, we're going to rank news for credibility. So we won't put non-credible news on our platform. And then they subsequently said it, but we're going to let the users make that decision. <laughs> so what happened in between those two announcements? They realized that if they actually said that they were going to do it, that they were going to become a publisher, which meant they had to take responsibility for the content on their platform, which meant they no longer had safe harbor protection. So they all of a sudden backed up. Now, obviously, the Breitbart InfoWars crowd can totally game that system, saying InfoWars is totally credible. We, I vote for InfoWars, which they will do. And so nothing will change until these companies have to take that responsibility that every other media organization in the world does, which is you're publishing this stuff. And by the way, they're already curating everything they do. You see a lot different stuff than you do on Facebook. They're making curatorial decisions every second of every day because they just have an algorithm doing it. But that's no different than having an editor do it. And as I say, they've certainly edited out all the porn. So, I mean, that's an editorial decision. You know, so I, I don't see how they can stand on this. And so from my point of view, and I know Will has thought about this too, 
attacking this safe harbor thing is the most important task we have, and then we'll see what happens from there. Can we buy your book from you or Amazon? Yes, buy it on Amazon. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's easy. <laughs> Thank you. All right.